welcome everybody um, and thank you very much Chiara for wanting to share your research with um, all of us and um, Chiara and thanks a lot for also sending me uh, some some words on your trajectory as well and as I can see which I couldn't find online um, Chiara is an Italian scholar in the broad sense, meaning that her education, uh, let's say, went through the University of Pisa, the University of Venice, and um, the University of Trento as a postdoc. And currently, she's an assistant professor in Siena, if, if I'm reading correctly. Um, so congratulations on this new post that I understand from what you say that it's quite recent. Um, she, uh, her research uh, combines um, two disciplines, or at least um, some disciplines, or the crossroad between some disciplines that are of utmost importance right now in Europe, such as, for example, data protection and consumer protection. Um, she also participates in this European project of Reus and Tricore, that uh, thanks to which we met. We met. Um, and anyways, and in this data protection also, she has this fantastic paper uh, that I read on, on the remote teaching uh, and, and uh, that I truly enjoyed. And uh, today she's gonna be presenting this, um, this dream that many consumer law scholars we have, right? Of thinking that we may be able to apply some of the consumer law warranties that we have to these data challenges presented um, in our uh, in our current environment. So I leave you the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, if if that's okay with you, uh, I mean you determine how you want the session. But uh, roughly, if you could have the presentation with forty five minutes and then fifteen for Q and A, and if not, you can you are welcome to take questions if that's what you want. And uh, thank you very much, Kiara. The floor is yours. First of all, I want to thank Mireya and. <laughs> Sebastian, for the invitation and for for uh, allowing me to share uh, my result, my um, research and my thoughts about the relationship between data protection and consumer law. Today, I will try to foster the complementarity perspective, which was proposed by some scholars at European level, and try to um, assume also a critical perspective uh, on such, uh, on such uh, complementarity approach, trying to identify the risks uh, of this of this approach. Um, so uh, I just mm, I will start uh, exposing my my mm, the main uh, um, um, questions that I addressed in the paper and in my in my studies, and then I will try to to uh, apply these uh, these questions to some. Uh, to some uh, um, EU uh, directives, and particularly the unfair contract terms directive, the unfair commercial practices directive, and the, the directive on digital contents and, and digital services, and then lastly, the, um, to the directive on collective interest of consumers. Then I will try to draw some conclusions and at, at least to formulate new questions for further um, investigation. Starting from the beginning, the research questions. Uh, First of all, uh, I will start with a really frequent starting <laughs> in, in, this, um, in this field that personal data are uh, exploited from a, um, an economic point of view and the metaphor of personal data as new oil is um, uh, widespread and um, more and more um, digital businesses uh, have at the core the processing of personal data and of data more generally, but today I will focus on personal data. This is uh, um, some 
<laughs> some numbers from the European Union, which uh, uh, confirm the importance of personal data within our economy. Um, Against these backdrops, several scholars investigated the relationship between consumer and data protection law, uh, fostering the uh, integration between these two fields and trying to understand how, how the interaction can work uh, has, um, in, in our, uh, in our uh, system. And in this, in this, um, between this, uh, um, among these uh, studies, uh, um, some scholars fostered um, a complementarity approach, trying to see how how uh, consumer law and, and data protection law can complement each other, and trying to foster the complementarity also um, in the interpretation of, of data protection and consumer law, and in the application, of course, of such, of such laws. Um, my research question starts from this perspective and built on uh, on this perspective, trying to to ask ourselves whether the the fostering of complementarities between data and consumer protection is enough. Is enough for what? For for um, regulation of the economic aspects of the um, of the um, relationship between the data subject and controller and for ensuring effective protection to the data subject. My research concerns the European context that as you, as you all know is characterized by specific policies, both in the field of personal data protection and of consumer law. Uh, of course, uh, uh, other, uh, other um, um, studies that exist which deals with the uh, um, American approach on the intersection between consumer and data protection law or uh, including the Asian approach on this on this topic but today I will focus on the European context and European um, um, sources of law. Um, so the, re the reason behind my, my uh, main question is that the difference that I found um, exists uh, between the consumer professional um, 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 relationship and the data subject controller one. Um, trying to, to, to make my point clear quickly, uh, I found that the consumer professional relationship is generally conceived as a contractual relationship based on an exchange within the market. Uh, of course, is much more complex than that, but just to, to have a starting point. Um, the data subject controller uh, um, relationship is mm, is characterized is more complex uh, and is characterized at least by two aspects. On the first side, we have the um, the one uh, that is um, linked with with a collection of personal data, and, and on the other side, we have the aspect connected with the economic consequences of personal data processing. I, I just try to clarify a little bit uh, now. The first aspect uh, of the relationship that is uh, connected with the collection of personal data. And of course, in our system, and uh, we, we, we know that uh, there is a the development of digital and physical and, um, environments where personal data are massively collected and mis um, are growing business models where the, the subject access the service and the controller collect personal data. An example is um, the one of of Google or Facebook, where I can access the service and and um, when I'm using the service, the platform is collecting 
personal data concerning me and my activity. And from an economic perspective, a lot of scholars qualified this, this um, relationship as a, an exchange. Uh, and then we will see how, how it's difficult for, to frame this, um, um, this um, relationship within uh, the law. Um, the second aspect of relationship between <laughs> Um, um, between the data subject and, and the controller is connected to the economic consequences of the personal data processing. In this, in this respect, we can focus on the, uh, on the raising of big data and predictive analytics, which allows to, um, to um, a detailed um, um, knowledge of the data subject behavior and her preferences and predictive analytics analysis of a future action. For example, an example is uh, affective computing, which is able to, to, to um, predict our emotions based on the analysis of some of a, a large, huge um, amount of data. Inside uh, here, the question is, the main point is that processing may allow the data controller to acquire a deep knowledge concerning the data subject, which could be um, exploited to influence her choices, including those of economic nature. And in this regard, both the Working Party Article 29 and the European, the European Data Protection Board um, acknowledged that and um, highlighted how targeting and marketing based on, on, on such uh, analysis of, uh, of personal data may lead to a, um, an influence of the, um, of the data subject with regard to economic choices and economic preferences. So, I found that there is a difference between the structure of the relationship uh, of, between consumer and professional um, um, and the relationship between the other controller and the, the other subject has uh, the second one uh, is um, at least twofold. From there, my question for, for, for regulating the economic aspects of the subject controller um, um, the relationship, it, it is enough to foster complementarity of consumer and data protection law, or we need something more. And from a more theoretical perspective, my question is if the exchange paradigm and the related focus on contracts is adequate for solving the legal questions arising from processing of personal data for, for commercial or productive purposes. I tried to investigate these questions uh, looking at the application of some of some directives um, in the field of consumer law and here you you find uh, uh, the um, directives on, on which I focused and I will try to share my analysis with you with you now I will start from the unfair contractual terms directive and in in this regard, the first point is that the um, Article 1 of the Unfair Commercial um, Unfair Contractual Terms Directive states that the purpose of this directive is to approximate the law regulation and administrative provisions of the member states relating to unfair terms in contracts concluded between a seller or supplier and a consumer. And then the main question is uh, that the applicability of that directive 
depends on uh, on the qualification of processing under national law and here the question is it is whether there is a contract under national law and whether the data processing can be qualified as a contract under national law. Uh, there are different aspects that has been considered by, by scholars and by the case law. Uh, a first example concerned private policies for example, in, the, in Germany, several courts uh, found that private policies can be qualified as part of terms and conditions, and then the, the uh, unfair con contractual terms the directive can be, uh, can be applied. Um, in, in Italy, the debate is ongoing. Uh, on this issue, and um, and uh, I proposed one one in interpretative uh, um, path, and um, I tried to 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 um, to argue that uh, it could be useful to distinguish between the um, to, to distinguish by reason of the link between the contract and the, the processing in the concrete case, and that in some cases it is possible to to affirm that the privacy policies are part of the contract. For example, in the case in which the private the contract is the mean with which the controller acquire access to data for example for example in case of um, in the um, in case of collection that uh, is uh, allowed by the uh, entering of the sub of the data subject into the environment for example the social networks one which is governed by terms and conditions in that case i think that the the privacy policy is part is part of the contract because it allows to define the the, the subject matter of of the contract um but this is just one example um and we can say that where and if we qualify the privacy policy as part of the contract, then the unfair contractual term directives would be applicable. The same point uh, and the same questions uh, arises with regard to concept to processing in some cases, in some cases, and in some legal orders, uh, concept processing has been considered by scholars, for example, for example, as, as of contractual nature, and then the the uh, the unfair contractual terms directive could apply. Uh, so uh, another time we have the application of of the directive depending on national law qualification. Um, in this respect, uh, uh, I I think that the uh, the case aren't. Um, um, Romania by the Court of Justice uh, um, makes an interesting point, uh, saying that there, there are a strong difference between the um, um, the um, requirements for the validity of consent to processing and contract consent, and then it is quite difficult to qualify consent to processing has contractual. Um, another option that was considered in, in by scholars, by really important scholars, is to qualify uh, consent processing as a consideration. And in certain legal systems, uh, such as the um, Italian one, the consequence would be to create an obligation to, to give consent to processing. And this obligation would be difficult uh, to, uh, to allow, um, in presence of this obligation, is difficult to qualify this consent to processing as freely given 
under the GDPR and also in the light of the interpretation of this requirement uh, made by the Court of Justice. However, uh, another, uh, another case, uh, another option is to, to consider clauses, contractual clauses which create an interference between the contract and consent. We have an example, for example, we can have a consumer credit contract according to which the contract will be executed only after the client gives his consent to processing of data collected in the home banking services for marketing purposes. In such case, I, I think that the um, unfair contractual terms directive would be applicable. Summing up the uh, application of the unfair contract terms directive to, to, um, to the, the um, relationship between the data controller and data subject depends on the contractual qualification of some aspects of data subject data controller um, a relationship, for example, <laughs> the privacy policies, which vary depending on the concrete case and national jurisdiction considered. So this is a huge obstacle to a uniform interpretation and uniform uh, approach to the application to the unfair contractual, of the unfair contractual terms directive to personal data processing. Moving to the second to the second example, the unfair commercial practices directive and its relationship with, with personal data processing for for economic purposes. Um, in this case, we we do not have the same problem because the directive applies to unfair business to consumer commercial practices before, during, and after a commercial transaction in relation to a product. So we do not have the same problem of the contractual qualification of the data subject and controller um, um, uh, uh, relationship that we have, we have with regard to the application of the contractual terms directive. But uh, um, with regard to the contractual practices directive, we should uh, ask ourselves in which cases the conductor um, um, uh, connected to the processing of personal data may be considered a, a, as a commercial practices uh, uh, and in which case the practice is to be considered unf unfair. Um, we have to start, of course, and uh, rely on on definitions. And in um, in this field, we have here the definition uh, given by the contractual um, practices directive. And um, moving from this definition, we can um, we can see that at the EU level, the uh, EU Commission in 2016 uh, affirmed that in some cases, uh, the violation of rules on personal data protection may be considered in the assessment concerning the unfairness of, uh, of a practice, for example, in cases of uh, in cases uh, where the um, trader process of consumer data in violation of, of data protection um, requirements uh, for purposes that are, of course, related with the market and, with econ and for economic purposes. Um, at the uh, at the, um, at the national level, for example, in Italy, the Council of State stated that due to the economic value of personal data concerning users, the information concerning data processing provided by the controller is to be assessed under the commercial practices directive, and in several occasions that. Um, <laughs> the lack of information on the use of commercial data uh, of personal data i'm sorry for profit is considered has an unfair commercial practice um looking forward i think that it could be really uh, interesting to think about the possibility to consider 
the, the processing as such in the light of the unfair commercial practices directive, for example, in case in cases where a professional processes personal data concerning a consumer for the purpose of advertising, violating, for example, the principle of data minimization. So going beyond the question of information of the, of the data subject. And uh, I think that in, in, in such cases, we can think that processing it as such is a commercial practice uh, due to the possible economic consequences of such processing, for example, uh, um, profiling or 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 um, targeting or, or or other kind of um of commercial uh purposes uh of processing um in any case i want to i want to stress that um the where the, the processing uh, is carried out for for productive purposes the directive on unfair commercial practices will not be applicable. Uh, we can think about a company which processes data for um, training an artificial intelligence system, um, which uh, is not sure that will be, uh, will be um, Uh, launched on the market In, um, and we can imagine that the company uh, violates the principle of data minimization or uh, or other principles concerning personal data processing and in such cases we can we can think about what rules should be applied and to this practice and which would be the role of the subject in enforcing such um, rules. And we can also think about the question whether data protection law is uh, enough for, for um, regulating the aspect of the, um, of the um, relationship that uh, concerns the economic the economic value gained by the company uh, through an unlawful data processing uh, with this question i just move to the to the to the next uh, uh, to the next uh, um, to the next uh, directive and uh, in this regard um I, I move to to another sorry to another um, mm, uh, group I would say of of um, EU legal instruments where the uh, where the um, <coughs> the directives directly creates a link between consumer law and data protection law so it's not the, uh, the lawyer or or the judge that have to find the intersection but the directives directly and um, expressively uh, creates uh, a link between data and consumer protection. This is the case of the new directives on uh, digital content, but also the directive on, uh, on uh, uh, collective interests of consumers. Um, just to start from the first one, um, both the directive on, on digital services and content and the directive of on consumer rights as amended by directive uh, 192161 uh, adopted a new um, technique that expressly as i said uh, links data protection and consumer law in, in defining the scope of application of such of such directives i will just i will just focus on on the first directive as it is the first one where this technique was used and and adopted but the directive as all you know um applies to contracts between 
traders and, and consumers concerning digital content and services, but applies also where the trader supplies or undertakes to supply digital content or a digital service to, to the consumer and the, the consumer provides or undertakes to provide personal data to the trader and then the rule um, poses some conditions um, for this application that I, I will not consider for now. Um, the interpretation of this rule is quite complex and is debated uh, in by scholars and I, I, I think that also by judge in a while. Um, but among other aspects, I would focus on the relationship between the application of the directive, the processing of personal data and contract. And this is an aspect that, that uh, has been considered by some national, um, um, national laws in, um, in, uh, um, in, um, uh, transposing the, the directive. Uh, so, uh, of course, the relationship varies depending on, on national laws, but in any case, I think that the wording of the directive is significant as the part of Article 3, Paragraph 1, which um, uh, deals with the um, processing of personal data does not expressly refer to contracts. And in this regard, uh, uh, a strong role was played by the European Data Protection Supervisor uh, that gave a very strong and critical opinion on the previous uh, version of the of the of the um, <laughs> directive, and here you find the references of this opinion that I think it's really interesting also because um, the um, supervisor tries to balance the different possible interpretation and positions. From our point of view, the, pro the provision on the scope of application of EU directive uh, on digital content and services extends the application of remedies provided for by the directive to cases where the economic advantage, advantage gained by the operator in the supply of a service or a digital content consists of, of the collection of data concerning the data subject regardless of the contractual qualification of the subject controller um, relationship. What, uh, what I mean, um, that the, the directly, um, the, the um, directive uh, um, does not require to qualify as a contractual, the, the relationship between the data subject and the data controller for allowing the application of, of the remedies provided for the, by the directive. Um, from, a, from a more theoretical perspective, I think that Article 3 shows the difficulties of framing from a legal point of view, the, the, um, the um, relationship where the data controller offers a service or, or digital content in exchange for the possibility to collect data about the consumer. And so skipping to the last uh, uh, example, uh, that is the directive on the collective interests uh, of consumers. Um, also in this directive, there is a, a direct link between data protection and consumer law. Um, indeed, Article 2 of the directive provides with a quite complex uh, rule that the, 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 um, 
directive applies to uh, to actions brought against infringements um, by traders of provisions of funeral law uh, uh, mentioned in an annex and infringement that harm or may harm the collective interest of consumers what for our purposes, our next one um, mentions both the directive uh, on e-privacy e and the, the GDPR. But what uh, I want to stress here is that the, in the interpretation of the directive, a very important point is uh, the definition of interests of consumers, because uh, on this, um, definition uh, is based the, the possibility of apply or not apply the the, the directive and um, in this respect article 3 of the of the directive is not very useful as the definition is quite quite um, disappointing because it's really um, a repetition of the definition and so um, the interpretation of the scope of application of the directive will surely depend on the choices of national uh, or national law in transposing the, the, the directive but I think that in light of the importance of that processing for contemporary economies and the potential economic relevance of processing within the data subject data controller um, relationship, where processing is carried out for economic purposes, then violation of the GDPR um, uh, have to be considered as harming or that can um, uh, arm the interests of consumers. And then um, we can affirm that the, the um, directive applies. Um, from a theoretical perspective, again, I think the uncertainty in the in interpretation of the rules um, concerning the scope of the, of the directive is due to the um, difficulty in defining where processing of personal data can be considered part of a consumer relationship. Now moving to the conclusions, and I think that I'm in, in time. Moving to the conclusions, I wanted just to, to draw two, two different um, parts. Um, of the conclusions. First, I will try to classify the consumer law directives I analyzed in two groups based on the way in which they frame the um, relationship between data and consumer law. And then I will try to, to draw some conclusive um, remarks in a theoretical perspective and formulating new new questions for further for further um, research. Uh, the first point, uh, I think that we can uh, uh, um, create two groups uh, of the of um, directive. A first group where person data processing may become relevant for the application of consumer law, but it is not an element that contributes to define the scope of application of the directive. This is the case of the firm contractual terms directive and of the firm commercial practices directive. Um, a second group is uh, composed by the directives where the scope of application of, of the legal instruments is defined by linking expressly data protection and consumer law. And this is the case of the directive on digital content, the directive on consumer rights, and the directive on, um, on collective interests of consumers. Um, Moving to conclusive uh, remarks, um, I think, as I said, that a, um, an obstacle in, in fostering the 
complementarity perspective between consumer and data protection law is the difference between the consumer um, um, trader um, relationship that traditionally is conceived as based on the exchange paradigm and the contract, and on the other side, the complex data subject controller um, relationship that is based on personal data processing, and that I tried to show that have at least two, uh, two uh, aspects to be considered. Um, just to give you an example uh, on how the, the, this difference can be an obstacle for fostering the complementarity approach um, in relation to the application of the unfair contractual terms directive and within the, the definition of the scope of application of the uh, directive on digital services and content, um, only one part of the that, that subject data controller um, uh, um, uh, relationship is considered as the directives do not take in, into account the economic consequences of the processing of consumers' personal data, which are particularly relevant, as we have seen, for example, in relation of marketing or targeting or profiling also. Um, and so an emerging risk, I think, of, of the complementarity approach with regard to the one and uh, um, the protection of personal data and on the other end, directive and on, on unfair contractual terms and on digital services and content uh, and content is to use categories, uh, contract and ex exchange that may not grasp and make um, um, make uh, visible the imbalance of power based on personal data processing of some contemporary business models, which may lead, as we, as we have seen, to influence the data subject thanks to the processing of personal uh, data concerning her. Um, so, uh, uh, I think that against this backdrop, the directive on collective interests of consumers raises an important knot, that is, which are the consumers' interests, which with, with um, respect to the processing of personal data. This issue will have to be addressed and solved in order to define the scope of application of this directive, but I think that also leads to new, to new questions. And these questions are uh, two. <laughs> um, the first one is beyond fostering um, a complementary approach in applying data protection and consumer law. Is there a need for further regulation of, of the economic aspects of data subject controller relationship? And if so, what kind of technique should be used for and pursuing which objectives? Um, in this vein, I think that another question is whether consumer law can be adapted to the protection of the economic interest of the data subject, taking into account the complexity of the um, 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 of the um, data subject controller um, relationship, which cannot be framed only through the paradigm of exchange. So I, I, I finish here my, my, my presentation and I thank you for the attention.